Welcome to another episode of Stories from the Edge of Life. We once again have Dr. Mohammad Hidayatullah. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my uh, experience and thoughts about the life and the end of life and all this thing. Absolutely. Yeah, we want we want to extract everything we can, uh, you know, from the wisdom you've gained over the years. So, uh, before we get into the questions, would you mind introducing yourself to audience one more time, please? Yeah, uh, I'm a palliative care physician, um, uh, trained as an anesthesiologist and worked in pain management for almost nine years, then moved to palliative care. And uh, after uh, qualifying, uh, after taking the uh, American Board of uh, Hospice and Parity Medicine uh, and made my life fully dedicated or my career dedicated to palliative care and has been working uh, since then, uh, since uh, 2003 till 2023, uh, I was working as a palliative care physician and retired uh, resigned as a palliative care consultant from King Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and currently based in London, and open for uh, independent consultations and education in palliative care. Outstanding. And I'm Parag Bharadwaj, and I'm a hospice and palliative medicine physician in the US. So... Thanks for coming back. And in our last interview, we spoke about your professional journey. In this interview, I'd like to learn a little bit more about, you know, what was the impact your work uh, made on you as a person? So uh, you, you know, you, you, I mean, in a lot of ways, you have been a pioneer in uh, promoting palliative care in the Middle East. And you have seen a lot of changes you've been a leader what are the key uh, lessons that you've learned from your professional career personally that you would like to share with the audience yeah uh, one important thing that i have uh, kept in mind while practicing palliative care is that we need to respect the feelings and the culture and the whatever um, uh, religious background, whatever uh, the patient's uh, ethnic uh, rules or whatever it is, in that respect, we have to treat the patient and never try to impose yourselves, your thoughts, your ideas on a patient who is uh, uh, weak and vulnerable or the family members who are very desperate. Uh, for for example, I have taken patients who are, um, uh, you know, like during after the diagnosis of cancer, it breaks the you know the whole strength of the patients and their family members. They are so desperate; they seek whatever, and many, in many ways, they come and ask me, "Is there anything else we can do to save the life of our beloved one?" Like if they know that I'm from back from Indian background, they used to ask me, is there anybody in India who any herbal medicine or anything that can cure the cancer? They're ready to do that. So, so the, you know, it shows their desperate, their vulnerability. So in that situation, what I, you know, our as a physician or a caretaker, it's very important for us to uh, maintain our integration and try to be, uh, you know, respect the feelings of the patients and their families, not to you know, impose our thoughts, our ideology, our beliefs, or our uh, you know, faith on them. So this is one of the things that I have learned. I remember when, in one of the meetings, um, uh, I was attending in, in uh, a palliative care conference in India. Um, a pay, uh, there was a lecture in English, they said that you know we have um, uh, a, it, there was a dying patient and we have read a religious book from their faith to him. He was a different religious, uh, uh, different religion. But I felt very bad and I stood up and questioned, why did you do that? When a patient is dying, why do you want to read from your religious text to him, knowingly that he is, belongs to a different religion? 
so this you know a conflict or uh, you know uh, taking or uh, abusing the weakness of a patient uh, i felt bad it should not happen this is my take and all that. i respect it as i told you before in my previous uh, lecture uh, uh, discussion that i've taken a strict hindu a strict uh, christian a strict muslim uh, patients and never try to influence them by my thoughts and my yes i have respected them they have came back and said thanks to me for for doing that and i felt very happy that i have not done anything wrong being a professional i have not uh, you know um, made any um, what i must say uh, created a distrust between myself and my patient thank you for the very valuable insight and uh, you know let me ask you you have worked in the middle east as we mentioned you took care of patients from a lot of different countries who worked there uh, you probably covered at least you've served patients from uh, you know more than probably half the planet you know based on their background from which countries they came from are we that different or are we that similar no we we you know like everybody is different i should say you know like when i came across patients they have you know they have different backgrounds they have different thinking different uh, problems different way of thinking i remember one patient sorry i am maybe giving examples because that will make uh easy for me to convey my uh, thoughts and my that's ideas perfect. that's perfect yeah i saw a patient uh, you know a, a advanced case of breast cancer she was uh, having huge pleural effusion and patient was uh, uh, almost very terminal i was uh, asking what the family member the husband was that the primary caregiver and was the responsible person i was telling him that this patient is having short of breath and she is making difficult and it is not right for this patient to go through the in case if anything happens to go to icu or to uh, have the cpr done and it will you know it's unethical or a sort of not right but this patient was refusing saying that no it is uh, not uh, according to uh, you know his beliefs and his faith and all that he was of course he was a muslim but i you know there is uh, religious fatwas or uh, you know given by the highest uh, uh, authority in saudi arabia that if anything if the patient becomes very sick and uh, there is no hope of him to reverse the uh, process of his deterioration because of a life limiting disease if he is suffering then uh, he could be made uh, no cpr dnar and uh, should be the comfort should be the focus of care and i gave him i even printed the fatwas and gave it to me read it and it is from from the highest uh, islamic scholars and uh, there is no harm in that but he was very adamant in it so finally one day when i was sitting in my office the nurses came and said this patient is gasping and shall we call the court i said Uh, because the patient has no, the family has not agreed for dnar and uh, in the uae it was not uh, allowed the patient to die without exposing to the uh, court team so i said call the court team that is what we have to do and i again went to the husband and said um you know we have to do something take a decision right now either we do a code or uh, uh, we, we do a cpr or or just we have to decide something he said no no i will pray and find out so he went into the stand stood on the praying mat and started praying and the court team all arrived and was standing all around the patient and the he was gasping and uh, what we can do and i said oh, come on start the court because being the head of the section i had uh, you know have to take the uh, give the orders for them to do so they started cutting open the uh, the dress that uh, then suddenly he uh, got out from his uh, praying mat and said 
oh, stop, stop, stop. When, when he saw that there would be an action, you know, like exposing and doing CPR and all that, he said, so that was a very difficult situation. You know, like I being was exposed to that, you know, when there was a conflict between the, the family member and the patient was almost like, and within a few seconds or a few minutes, the patient's uh, breath uh, the, it took the last breath and uh, he expired. So such situations have come across and we have to respect the, the feelings of the family members. Uh, at the same time, uh, save the patient from uh, unnecessary uh, you know, trauma of going through the CPR in that stage of uh, the disease. So this, uh, such things happen. Thank you, and I'm you know, so glad to hear you were there that day so that the patient could get the care. And you, you're right. Sometimes, you know, patients, family members desire one thing, but when they actually see the process being initiated, then they actually realize yeah. the, the gravity of the decision that they're making for their loved one. And, you know, often yeah. back, back off if they actually witness what the decisions involve. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Now, wh where I was going with, uh, <clears throat> with the question was, because you've seen taking care of patients with, uh, you know, such different backgrounds, at the core of it all, aren't we all the same in terms of, you know, our basic needs, like you mentioned in uh, the previous interview, you know, most, most uh, people really, you know, especially in our field, need somebody, need a shoulder to cry on, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, just for the support, at the end of the day, regardless where you come from, uh, people are people. Yes. Yes, this is what I, I felt in um, working in UAE, where, uh, as I told you, that my the unit used to be full of different background patients from uh, Kazakhstan, from India, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, also some Arab countries. So uh, their suffering is safe. You know, every patient with the pleural effusion has a shortness of breath, whether he is from <laughs> this background, as long as our bodies and structures are made of the same, we have the same. Uh, suffering is same, and even the the pain is same, and also the expression is same. So, you know, all of them need the the diff same type of uh, care, where you know the kindness and uh, uh, connecting to the patient and feeling empathy and uh, em uh, empathizing with the, their suffering is the main, uh, you know concept or main mantra of uh, practicing palliative care. So this is common to everybody. You know, there's no difference in that. And every uh, patient with this suffering will respond to this, uh, uh, this kindness or whatever uh, gestures that you do in that direction, they will respond to it. So, uh, you know, I had a very uh, uh, prolonged experience with different uh, patients with different backgrounds and also the changing scenarios you know if you see in Saudi Arabia when I was when I started practicing there in uh, late 90s and uh, early 2000 uh, I found that the they were more um, uh, closed in their societies and in their thought process and all this but um, as the time has changed, when the, they're exposed, the, in those days, you know, um, talking to the patients and the family used to need an interpreter. I have to uh, use my broken Arabic to speak to them. Now, if you, when I left, you know, all the patients and most of the patients and with their family members were speaking fluent English, so the communication became easy. Similarly, they're, they are more open, you know, they're, uh, because of the Google and internet, you know, everybody is finding, uh, remedies. Um, I, I know that 50% uh, of them were uh, from the WhatsApp University, as they call it. Uh, you know, but a lot of information they get is also related, and we have to explain to them and um, you know tell them what is the background of this information, whether this is applicable to your specific uh, family member or not, and. Uh, you know, these things are there. With, this, with the changing society, uh, is also changing the 
perception and the uh, understanding of the suffering and all this. So palliative care at that time used to be very negative. When I started practicing palliative care, I remember when I went to see a, a, a child with the uh, uh, um, leukemia, uh, it was advanced case. When I entered, uh, when the, they were giving the bone marrow transplant, everything was done for the patient, and the, finally they called the palliative care. As a consultation, when they made the consultation, I went there. When I was entering the unit, I saw the, the ward clerk seeing this. Oh, they called palliative care? Oh, now the, the case is gone. So it was as if, you know, the last thing that needs to be done. But uh, that that concept has changed now. If I go now, I see the patients right from the day one. You know, when the many oncologists used to refer to us on the first day of their consultation, they used to make a booking with the palliative care clinic also for either for pain management or just for introduction. So that when the disease advances, when the symptoms uh, becomes unbearable or when they and not treated with a simple analgesics when they need higher doses of morphine or oxycodone or something, then the they should you know the the physician should be known to them you know so that it will not be a, a new thing for uh, a new um, uh, name for them palliative care. So these changes are occurring. So this is a good uh, and a progress in, uh, I saw in that in that direction. Yeah, I can I can relate to your experience. I once remember I was in the hospital and a healthcare, um, you know, clinician asked me what I did, and when I told them I'm a palliative care physician, I actually stepped back a few, <laughs> few step took a few steps back and said I'm so sorry, <laughs> and <laughs> I was like I don't have a disease, you know, and uh, uh, but yeah, I can relate to the exactly what you're saying now. Uh, it's just fascinating to hear you uh, because you've had such a wide uh, scope of experience treating patients from different backgrounds, uh, which I always found fascinating about you. Um, so you've seen a lot of patients dealing with adversities. Of course, you know, people deal with them differently based on their own personal preferences and where they come from. But what, what have you noticed of what is life all about? What is your take on that? Um, life all about is happiness. You know, like people feel very satisfied, very uh, content when they are happy, free from disease, free from suffering. But once suffering starts, then life becomes a burden. I have seen that patients, uh, in the in the cancer patients, uh, with advanced disease, they have no desire to live. I've seen them, you know, like uh, very terminal patients, not even terminal patients, you know, they become, their whole, uh, uh, you know, soul and the, it, it gets disturbed and it, it's uh, the whole structure get uh, 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 broken because of uh, the diagnosis uh, of a life repeating disease that they have. Or, you know, after that, they start thinking about the future, about what will happen. And as, as has been um, described in the total pain as the, you know, the suffering, the social aspect of the psychosocial aspect of the suffering, it's totally true. You know, uh, it's not just theoretical, the, the total pain. I have seen a professor coming in uh, saying that um, I have, uh, my, you know, my children are grown up. But recently have married and have a small kids. But after my marriage, I was diagnosed with this disease. And I'm now, I could not sleep for the last one month because I'm every night I think about what will happen to these small kids. Why did I marry? I should have remained like that after the death of my first wife. Why I have married and, and my little kids are, uh, who will take care of my uh, the second wife and my small kids after that? after my death. So this is, you know, a feeling, you know, I, on that day when he expressed this uh, uh, desperation or, you know, I, I spent one hour with him, talking to him and 
giving different uh, based on his background some religious uh, quotations from uh, islamic texts and also from um, thinking in his own way and after that uh, started on antidepressant uh, simple antidepressants uh, tcas and then after after that he next time when he came he was a different person so you know treating the patients apart from the uh, the chemical treatment or the with the medications a discussion or talking will also because they don't have anybody to lighten their heart so when they come to us as a palliative care physician uh, and talk to you know they open up their heart and speak up their mind to us we need to listen very patiently and uh, and try to um, uh, resolve their the, the, the knots that are there in their mind and that makes them very light for them and they changes their whole you know perspective and may change their whole uh, the light in their burden which is there on their mind yeah it sounds like uh, you were there uh, as a very good sounding board for the patient and it made a huge difference for him yeah so i think uh, what i'm hearing from you is that being able to be there for another human being and listening to them can be very powerful and therapeutic yes yes definitely uh, that's what i felt and i i really enjoyed that when they they, they come with a heavy heart and leave uh, light lightened and with a smile on their face i used to feel very happy i felt as if you know i have done my job it's not necessary whether i uh, have spent one hour with them one and a half hour with them whatever it is my usually the slots for me for my new patient used to be half an hour and for uh, for follow ups were 15 minutes but and never i finished in that time you know the patients used to take longer time uh, may, on my clinic day on tuesdays you know i would always used to be late and uh, i'm thankful to my fellows who used to take my follow up cases and left the new patients to me <laughs> so it was very you know satisfactory at the end of the day i used to feel very satisfied when they leave with a smile on their face very nice. and i said thanks for sharing that perspective dr hitari to the uh before we wind up is there anything else in uh, terms of sharing any pearls of wisdom for our audience i think this is uh, if uh, they can get some clues from my discussion or my or my stories or my uh, case uh, reports that will be what uh, uh, you know what i want them to get uh, inspired by that if it it, it can help Uh, in making good political physicians and if um, if or as, as a physician itself not you don't have to be a political physician you have to be a, a good uh, a good uh, human being a good physician in any specialty if you because now the the thing is the 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 medical field has become very commercial and uh, you see a lot of patients waiting outside and the physicians don't have time to spend uh with the patients that that le- and most of the time they are directed towards their computers working on the uh electronic medical records um on their servers or uh, whatever program they are running and very little time to make eye contact and see look into their eyes and look into their face and talk to them so that is making uh, the whole medical practice very very in in my understanding this is not a uh, it's making us more uh, uh, mechanics than a physician where you you know i used to give in my presentations to the fellows the first you know we don't want to become mechanics where a car comes and we just try to fix some nuts and bolts and just go away you know we are dealing with human beings and there is human being that doesn't have a simple body it has a Uh, another aspect of them is the mind and we have to also attend to that mind not just the physical being or, or the you know uh, just the body as if we are fixing a machine so 
if you want to be a physician, you have to treat a, a human being as a human being, not as a, like a machine. That is my final, uh, I think, uh, understanding of being a physician. Thank you for sharing your insightful, uh, inspiring insights. And uh, I'm sure the audience will benefit from each one of them. Uh, and thank you so much. I, I hope we will have you back again. Uh, I mean, this, I think we just scratched the surface in terms of uh, all the experience you've had throughout your career. So I, I'm hoping that uh, you'll be willing to come again and, and share a lot more in the future with us. Sure, why not? You know, if, if it's of, uh, you know, if my talks is worth listening, I will definitely come back, and whenever you are invited, I will be ready to. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Sure. No, problem. thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. It was nice uh, talking to you, and uh, after a long time seeing you and talking to you, it's really a pleasure, uh, you know, in expressing myself and my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.